By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we've got some sweet tournament old school magic for you from the Raging Bull series. We have a green and a black deck being piloted by Evo and it's got a Lord of the Pit. So I'm really looking forward to check this deck out in action. And he's playing against Hank and Hank is bringing an Urnum Geddon deck to the table. And just to clarify, this is Hank the Groot because we've got multiple Hanks. Hanks is actually quite a common name in the Netherlands, but I think outside of the Netherlands, I've never really met a Hank outside of the Netherlands. If you have, let me know in the comments below. So like I said before, this is tournament magic. This is magic played in the Swiss round of the Raging Bull series, a tournament normally held in a pub in Amsterdam, but now held online because of obvious reasons. So this is the first round of the Swiss Evo against Hank. And uh, before we go to the action, as always, I have some nice deck photos and I'm gonna discuss the decks with you. Now, if you wanna skip, that part of the video, no worries, check the description below and there you will, you will find several timestamps. Click on the timestamp that reads MTG Games and that will take you straight to the action. And here I'm going to start with the deck of Evo. Let's take a look at his Lord of the Pit. And here we see the deck of, uh, of Evo. So it's black and it's green and I've called it Ramp to the Lord. And um, I've called it that way because there's quite some ramp in this deck, right? We see three Llanowar Elves, we see four Elves of Deep Shadow, and then of course we see that big, beefy Lord of the Pit. He's only playing with a one-off though. So he could possibly ramp into that Lord of the Pit. I'm hoping to see that, but he wants to do more than just that. Uh, than just that. I think there are some more kind of mid-range creatures in this deck that he's probably hoping to deploy early. For example, if he can get a turn one Elves of Deep Shadow and then a turn two Swamp, uh, he can cast a Hypnotic Spectre at turn two, which would be kind of nice. And if he gets some more ramp, he can even start casting like four casting cost spells like a Suchi, a Gem Day Tome, an Icy Manipulator. Um, if he can get into more ramp, he can start playing out those bigger beef boys. So it's quite interesting. And when we look at this deck in general, it's just not your typical black and green deck. So that alone makes it kind of worthwhile to look at this deck. I'm really looking forward to see some of the synergies that I'm seeing in this deck in action in this matchup. For example, he's playing with Tracker. So Tracker is one green two to cast for a two two from the dark. And for two green, what Tracker can do is it can fight target other creatures. So it deals damage equal to its power to target creature. And then it also gets damage back equal to the power of the creature it targeted, right? So for example, if you would choose Tracker on a Pearl Unicorn, uh, Pearl Unicorn dies, but also Tracker dies because Tracker gets two damage. Now some interesting uh, synergy in this deck is actually Tracker and Sorcerer's Queen. I just think that's really cool because Sorcerer's Queen, you can tap it and you can make target creature an O2. So you can use the Queen to make a creature an O2, then fight with it, uh, with the Tracker and kill it. So I think that that's just kind of funny. Some other synergies with the Tracker here are the Waluli Wolves. He's playing with a full play set of those. So he can use the Wolves to give target creature plus one, plus one. So he can give Tracker plus one, plus one, and then let it fight with a 2-2 uh, creature and kind of survive to tell the tale, right? So that's kind of interesting. In general, I think Waluli Wolf is this very annoying creature to play against because, for example, look at the Suchi, right? It's a 4-4. Four, four. Well, there's such a huge difference in this meta between having a 4-4 four, four or a 5-5 five, five, and a Waluli Wolf will make your Suchi a 5-5 five, five, and that will make it a lot more difficult to kill in combat, you know? And even with direct damage because all of a sudden the Psy Blast isn't enough anymore to kill a 4-4 four, four when you have a Waluli Wolf on the board. So, you know, Waluli Wolf can just be annoying because when you're doing your math, you constantly have to think, oh yeah, he's got a Waluli Wolf. Um, looking at the rest of the deck, we see some more classic synergies. For example, we see Royal Assassin Icy Manipulator. So Royal Assassin, this beautiful classical uh, magic card, uh, you can tap it to destroy target tapped creature. Icy Manipulator, you can tap down a creature, right? It's kind of an easy sum. It's easy synergy that has been around for ages, but it's beautiful synergy. And I'm really looking forward to see that in action. Now you might think, this deck, you know, they're, they're just a lot of one-offs. Why is that? Or they're just play sets that are not complete. For example, we see a Bayou, a beautiful unlimited Bayou, but we don't see a full play set of Bayous. I think the reason for this is actually, I know the reason for this, is that the Raging Bull series is play, playing according to the Swedish reprint rules. And the Swedish reprint rules uh, means that you cannot play with 4th edition and revised and chronicles. So you just play with uh, ABU and you play with the full horseman sets. 
And what I like about this is that this is the only tournament in the Netherlands where they do this. So it's one time a year where you kind of look at your collection and you think, okay, what do I have of ABU and Four Horsemen and what can I make? And I think this deck is really a nice example. You know, we see one Sorcerer's Queen, we see one Juzam Jin, we see one Lord of the Pit. He's really looking at the cards that he loves and he probably wants to play with and he's putting those in a deck. I think that's really cool. Now, before we move on to the deck of his opponent, Hank, uh, there's one thing that I would like to point out, and that is that there are no dark rituals in this deck. And maybe you're looking at those four powerful hypnotic specters and you're thinking, he's crazy. Why isn't he playing with four dark rituals? I think, and of course, I don't know because I, I don't know what uh, uh, choices Evo made when he was brewing this, but I think that his line of reasoning was a dark ritual into a hippie is basically card advantage, uh, disadvantage, right? Because I'm putting two cards on the table and I only get one in return because the dark ritual goes into my graveyard. So I have some tempo gain, but I also lose an extra card. With Elves of Deep Shadow, which he's playing four of, he also has tempo, ga uh, tempo gain, but he has long-term value. So turn one, he can play Elves of Deep Shadow. Turn two, he can drop an extra swamp and he has three mana, two black and one green and he can still cast Hypnotic Spectre. So instead of having a turn one uh, hippie play with the ritual, he's choosing a more uh, to go more for the value and the long-term play by playing Elves of Deep Shadow and going for the turn two Hypnotic Spectre play. So that's just what I wanted to say, maybe some food, food for thought and to think, do I wanna do this too or do I always wanna choose the Dark Ritual? That's of course completely up to you. Okay, this is the deck of Evo. Now let's take a look at the deck of Hank. And here we see the deck of Hank. So this is really your Urnum Geddon deck, right? At least at first glance, because we've got Urnum Jins in here and we've got Armageddon's in here. And uh, for people, uh, for the people that don't know what Urnum Geddon wants to do, it's a very well-known strategy in old school. You want to play out your creatures, ramp into your bigger creatures with your Lanawer Elves, and I guess in this case, your single Birds of Paradise. Also a beautiful Black Lotus in this deck, by the way. So use all the ramp that you have to play out your bigger creatures early, Savannah Lines, Urnum Jin, Sarah Angel. And then when those creatures are on the board, you cast an Armageddon, destroy all the lands in play, and then you've got the bigger creatures and that's how you're going to win the game. It's as simple as that. You know, that is the strategy. But when we zoom into this deck, there are a few things that I notice. First off, he's only playing with two Armageddons. Usually these decks tend to play with three. Another card that I'm not seeing here is Lantex. Lantex and Armageddon, they go great together. And that makes sure that after your Armageddon, if you've got the Lantex in play already, you're taking the most advantage out of the situation because even if your opponent manages to draw into lands before you, you've got the Lantex. But Lantex is not in here. Very interesting. And then we see a few cards that we don't see that often in an Urnum Ganon deck. We see two Winter Orbs, two Icy Manipulators, and three Relic Barriers. So that's quite interesting, right? Winter Orb, two to cast, and that is of course that infamous artifact that says you can only untap one land during your untap step. The interesting thing is you can turn this artifact off. So how can you turn it off? Simple, you need to tap it. So you can use your Relic Barrier to tap down the Winter Orb and then you can untap all the lands that you want. So that's kind of kind of a neat little uh, trick that Hank is playing in this deck. And I also think, Hank, that you've got a plan B because I dare see Titania's song in your deck. Uh, that's pretty cool. And remember, Evo has it in the sideboard. So we have a lot of songs in this matchup. So Titania's song, one green and three to cast from the Antiquity, uh, Antiquities expansion. And basically what it does is all your non-creature artifacts in play of both sides turn into artifact creatures with power and toughness equal to their casting cost and they lose all their abilities. For example, a Chaos Orb just becomes a 2-2 vanilla artifact creature when Titania's song hits the board. So I think this Titania song is kind of a plan B or a final beatdown strategy. If, you know, Hank has to control and he's like, well, I need some beef, I need some power on the board. He plays a Titania song and all of a sudden his winter orbs, his relic barriers, his ices get turned into creatures and he can start banging into his opponent or maybe finishing his opponent off. Um, the reason I'm saying finishing off is because I think this deck can go quite quick. So I'm expecting him to deal some damage 
in the early stages of the game and then maybe in the later stages of the game he can use a Titania Song to finish it off. Talking about that, another great card in this deck is If Biff Afrit, a 3-3 flyer from Arabian Nights. And the interesting thing about this card is it's a hurricane on a stick that both players can activate and both players play with green. So that could be quite interesting. So that hurricane effect, right? One green, one damage to each player and each creature with flying. So quite interesting to see it in, in here and quite risky also for Hank because he is playing against an opponent that also has access to green Mana. Okay, two really interesting decks. I'm looking forward to uh, to show this match to you and to watch this match myself as well. Let's go and let's take a look at Evo versus Hank. Game number one. Evo at the top, Hank at the bottom. Evo starting off here. He's playing with black and green and Hank is playing with white and green, the Urnum Ganon deck. So starting with the Mishra's Factory, beautiful winter edition. Passing turn to Hank here. And as you can see, the life total there on the left, 20-20. And you also see a clock ticking down. That's because this is a tournament. So 15, uh, 50 minutes each or 55 minutes each um, for the complete match. And there we see a Lanor Elves hitting the board with the Pendlehaven. A quick response with that Swords to Plows here. So I think that's a good decision by Hank. And uh, pass turn here, so Hank taking a damage, going to 19, and we see Evo going to 21 because of that uh, Swords. He's playing a Savannah and passing turn. There we see that single Bayou. Yeah, he's doubting. I think it's a good decision, Evo, not to attack with um, with that factory because your opponent has access to Disenchants and to Swords to Plows here. So there's a really big risk. You're going to lose your land when you attack with it. There's another Swamp, and we saw that Lanoir Elf from Hank tapping four. Oh, Juzam Jin! Love it. It's it's just so great to see this creature on the board. It doesn't see that much play, but whenever I see it, it's just fantastic. There we see the Library of Alexandria, and Hank is counting his cards. I don't think he has that many. So, ooh, there we see his swords on the Juzam. Yeah, you know it's going to happen. And I guess for Hank, there was a slight moment there where he thought, you know, maybe I should just try to save up my cards, but you can't really do that when you're facing a Juzam Jin. you know. You can't take hits from that for too long so I think it's a good decision to just uh, remove it from the game and now it's Evo Stern he's got a lot more creatures in the deck there we see a Hypnotic Spectre and that's of course a great way to deal with that library as well because I believe I see five cards in Hank's hand now it's going to go to four there is a Chaos Orb he's going to activate the Chaos Orb probably going to flip on the hippie here doesn't want to lose any cards there we go and I believe it's a hit And the Hypnotic Spectre is a goner. There we see another city tapping it down, taking a damage for another Lanower Elves. And it is interesting to see him that he plays uh, more lands after land number four. Perhaps he's got a Sarah Angel in hand. The reason I'm saying that is... Um, actually, you can use his Lanower Elves to cast uh, Sarah Angel. The reason I'm saying that is because he's the player, of course, that plays with Armageddon. So maybe he wants to keep land in hand. There we see Evo also playing more lands. Let's see what he can do. Does he have some more firepower? There's a Mux Emerald. And there's a Triskelion. So the 4-4 creature, right? A 1-1 one, one creature with 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters. And he can actually use that to start killing those uh, Lanower Elves if he wants to. But right now, there's not really a reason for him to do that. And there. Ooh, an Urnum Jin by Hank. And that Urnum Jin can start dealing some damage next turn. Evo looking at the hand, only two cards left. Hank only one card left. Next turn he can start swinging in, but of course Evo can choose to double block with the Mishra's Factory and the Triskelion, but then of course he's taking a risk because then if Hank has some kind of removal in his hand, you know, he can have the better deal. This is an interesting attack here, by the way. It looks like Hank has taken the damage, could have blocked with the Urnum, but things, you know, Evo... You have a trick up your sleeve. I'm just going to take the damage for now. So that means Hank is going to go to 13. And he now has to give Forest Walk to the Triskelion. That's kind of interesting as well. I'm expecting Hank to attack here. That Relic Barrier, by the way, that's really going to help Hank here. And he's tapping some more. He's going to 12. And there's an Armageddon. Okay, there we see the Armageddon. And this might be a crucial play. There is a Crumble in response on the Relic Barrier. That is actually kind of relevant. 
because that means he can no longer tap down to trike, but still he's in trouble. Well played by Hank. He's going to swing in for four here. Remember, Ifo is still on 21 because of um, because of those swords on his Juzam and uh, on his Lanaware Elves earlier in the game. So he's got some uh, some life to spend here playing a City of Brass. Attacking here, dealing uh, some more damage. So we see that life total going down to eight. And now he's going to use the dice to kill both of the Lanaware Elves. I think the other dice on there, by the way, is to indicate that it is Forest Walk. It's a bit confusing, but I think that's why it's on there. So he now has a 2-2 playing a Lanaware Elves. And he's attacking again. Interesting. Does he have a Giant Grove or something? He's taking the damage. Going to go down to six. Oh, I like this by Evo. I mean, I, I just think he's bluffing, you know. And the Force Walk now is changed to the Lanawar Elves. So that's not a plus one, plus one counter, but that's a Force Walker. And there we see a Strip Mine. So you can use the Strip Mine to take care of the Mishra's factory. The question, of course, is does he want to? And now he's going to attack with the Lanawar Elves. And you see, Hank, he keeps taking the damage. I wonder... I mean, I know he's, he's probably afraid of a Giant Grove, but he can decide just to block. I mean, he's on five. At a certain point, he'll have, he has to start blocking. And I guess Evo is just trying to see, okay, how far can I, can I get with my plan? And, uh, yeah, is he going to attack again? Yeah, he's attacking again. Okay, I mean, he's got to block, right? Because... Even if you think, okay, I'm going to take the damage because he has a Giant Grove, that would mean that Evo could use a Giant Grove, have a 4-4, get Hank on 1, kill him with the, with the Triskel. And okay, he's untapping the Lanawar Elves again. It looks like Evo is not quite sure now what to do. I kind of like this bluffing game, but I think, I think it's now time to stop with the bluff because like I said, it makes no sense for Hank to take the damage here uh, even if Evo has a Giant Grove. Okay, interesting. So he's going to go back to 6. Apparently, uh, drawing a card, passing turn, playing a scavenger folk. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, it looked like Hank was kind of in the driver's seat after the Armageddon, but when you look at the situation now, it, it's not looking great for Hank. The problem, of course, for Hank is that he cannot attack with the Urnum because then he opens himself up to, to just a lot of damage. Tapping three, going to 20. And, ooh, that Hypnotic Spectre that can fly over Hank. Okay, there's a little glitch, but oh, that Hypnotic Spectre can kind of finish it here. Hank passing turn cannot find any lands. Evo can now fly over the Urnum, bring him to four, and he has to lose a card. Wow, this is looking mighty bad. And it looks like Evo's going to roll for it. Okay, he's just gonna gonna pick a number, and uh, it was hard kind of to see what he discarded. But anyway, he takes two damage, goes to four, and loses a card. It's looking really bad for Hank. He's got to find some land. Oh, sinkhole! That's it. Okay, he's saying you know what? You've got this one. Ho ho! So that Armageddon really backfired on Hank. So both these players are gonna go uh, into their sideboards, dive into their sideboards, and we're gonna catch, catch back up with them in game uh, number two. Game number two, here we go. So I guess it's Hank on the play after losing that first one. Bit unlucky with the Armageddon because when he cast it, it looked like he had the victory. This is a good start by Hank, by the way, with that Birds of Paradise. But is there also a turn one play by Evo? Well, there is a turn one play, but it doesn't cost any mana. There's the Mox Emerald. And there is a Mishra's Factory. Is he going to attack? He's going to play a Soul Ring into Relic Barrier. Now we can tap down the Mox, choosing not to. Interesting. Relic Barrier, one of the reasons I like it so much is you can target those Mox in. But maybe Hank is forgetting here. And there we see the trouble. There's the Hypnotic Spectre. If he would have tapped down the Mox, he would have had an extra turn. Let's see if he has a solution. Tapping 4-5 Sarah Angel. Okay, there is a beautiful Sarah Angel there. 4-4 four, four Flyer and, of course, a perfect answer to that Hypnotic Spectre, and now he is reminding himself, okay, I gotta tap that Mox, good move, Hank. Mox is tapped. Evo there, playing another one. Oh, this is interesting, a Sorcerer's Queen. That's actually a big problem for Hank. 
If you're Hank, you're probably like, what? This guy's playing Sorcerer's Queen? How cool, but how super annoying. Maybe he can find a Swords here. I mean, he can now still attack. Sorcerer's Queen has Summoning Sickness, so at least he can swing in for four. And it's interesting to see, by the way, that Hank is finding his Library of Alexandria again, but it's not really going to help him because he's just so low on cards already. He wants to tap the Soul Ring. I wonder what he wants to do with that. I mean, he can he can play um, he can play a winter a winter orb, that is quite quite annoying, I guess, for Evo. If he has that one, the reason that he's doubting is maybe he has other options, better options. Tapping four now. Okay, no tapping three. What is he gonna do here? Okay, going for four. He's going all over the place. Okay, he's casting an Armageddon. That's quite interesting. That is quite interesting. Does he have a way to take care? Okay, Regrowth. Wow, very explosive play here by Hank. And he's regroving the Mishra's Factory, playing it out as well. And attacking with the Sarah. Doesn't have to tap it, of course. So, in a way, I like this, also because he's got the Relic for the Mox, but he hasn't solved this problem, and the problem is the Sorcerer's Queen. He's attacking now, so he's probably going to use Sorcerer's Queen to make it an 0-2. No, he's just going to take the damage. Wow, interesting, losing that City of Brass. He was probably hoping that Evo wouldn't attack. Oh, this is good. This is really good for Hank. Taking care of the Sorcerer's Queen now. So now he has a little bit of luck after that bad luck in game one. Attacking for four. Evo dropping to 13. And yeah. Well earned beer, Hank. Because you're back in it. And if you win this one, it's going to be a 1-1. One, one, and we're going to get a game number three here. There we see a swamp. What is Evo going to do? Looks like he's going to do nothing, which is good news for Hank. Just passing turn. And he's tapping the birds and the factory. No, he's untapping, attacking for four. That means that Evo is going to drop to nine here. Things are looking mighty bad for Evo. There is a forest. He needs to get rid of that Sarah. If he can get rid of that Sarah, things are actually not that bad because he's got more lands and he's got a handful of spells. Step number one is get rid of the Sarah Angel. And here you can really see the strength of the Sarah Angel because it can attack and it doesn't have to tap. So he can attack with it and use it as a blocker. And there we see the tracker. We talked about the tracker in the deck deck. So it's a 2-2 and for two green and tap, it can fight target creature. It looks like Evo is explaining what it does. So you can have a scenario where Evo decides to block the Sarah Angel with Hypnotic Spectre and then Evo can use the Tracker and kill the Sarah Angel because then the Sarah Angel will take a total of four damage. Of course, it does mean that Evo will then end lose Hypnotic Spectre and lose the Tracker, but you know, maybe there's a scenario next turn where Evo simply has to or else he's dead. You know, if you have to, you have to. There's a Sylvan by Hank, a great card in this scenario. Of course, he's attacking for four again. I'm expecting Evo to take it, and next turn he can possibly do the Trekker Hypnotic Trick. Let's see. I mean, he stepped out. Depending on what's in his hand, of course. Yeah, he's taking the damage. He's going to go to four. What is he going to do? I'm expecting him just to pass turn. He wants to keep two green open for the Trekker combination. And you know, if I'm Hank, I would just attack regardless. I mean, let him let him pay two creatures just to get rid of one. That's good news for Hank. Remember, he's got the uh, Mishra's Factory as well, right, to finish the job. He's got to put keep the pressure on. That's what I think. Let's see if Evo can do something here. No, he's passing turn. So I'm expecting that play now. We'll see. First, of course, Hank is going to look to the top three of his cards because of that Sylvan Library. And remember, Hank is actually still an 18. He can afford to pay four life to draw an extra card if he wants to. Choosing to draw one, though. Two cards in hand. Icy Manipulator! Oh! He doesn't have the mana to activate it, though. That is, This is interesting. I guess I wouldn't have played the Icy yet because you can't activate it anyway. I would have first attacked them, maybe play it in my second main. Because he can't use it. So, and he's not attacking. Okay, so what he wants to do now, because of that Icy, 
is of course step down that hypnotic specter and then I guess it makes sense because now Evo, well, he's not going to attack because then he's going to die. So he's not going to do that. He's going to play Wailuli Wolf and pass turn. The interesting thing, by the way, with Tracker is, although I'm not quite sure, does it tap both creatures? Also the creature it targets. I don't think it does, actually. Let me know in the comments below. I don't think it does. So Hank drawing an extra card here, Winter Orb. Probably going to tap down the Hypnotic Spectre, bringing him on one. He can use the bird. Oh, he's passing turn instead. He's going to play this very, very slowly. And he's stepping down the Mox and the Hypnotic Spectre. I think if I would have been um, Hank, I would have done it a little bit more aggressively, but that's just me. Maybe this control style is better. We'll see. Uh, I mean, Evo, he's pretty stuck here also because of that Winter Orb. What can he do, really? He probably knows that it's going to be really, really tough. He needs a little miracle to win this one. Hank's going to swing in for four, going to drop Evo to one here. Look at the life total going down to one. He's going to pass turn because of that Winter Orb. He can only untap one land. He's going to use the IC again. Tap down the other land, so going for full control, I think that's a good move here. Denying the black mana, maybe he's fearing a terror, so this way he can't even play out a terror. Then passing turn, and yeah, this is game, right? Gonna look at the top three cards. If I were Hank, I would just quickly make a decision, tap down the hippie and attack, because we also have to look at the clock, because this is tournament magic. That means you have 50 minutes per game and when we look at our per match and when we look at that clock they have 12 minutes left let's see what they're gonna do so he's tapping down hypnotic specter attacking okay that's it so the second game is won by hank and that means we're gonna get a game a number three exciting game number three let's see who's gonna win this one it looks like hank and evo both are taking a mulligan Evo on the play here, starting with a Mox Jet and a Basic Swamp. Passing on to Hank. Let's see what he can do. There is a Strip Mine taking care of that Swamp Passing turn here. Another Swamp Pass. There is, I think it looks like a Duel. Kind of hard to see with the Glare. But okay, there's a Strip Mine. Solves the problem. <laughs> okay, but we've got some new Glare. And uh, there is a Mistress Factory from Evo. So both players just playing out lands, destroying each other's lands with the strip mines. Okay, here we're going to see the first, I want to say the first creature, but it's actually an artifact, a Jam Day Tome by Evo. And will we see a swing in from the Mistress Factory? We won't because there is a Relic Barrier, I believe, tapping down the Mox Jet of Evo so that he cannot use his book. Maybe he can find another land. Exactly. And there is a Lana Where Elves. Interesting here, making the choice to play the Lanerer over uh, being able to possibly um, draw a card with the Gemdy Tome. Although, of course, now uh, with the Mistress Factory, he can attack. Okay, it looks like the players have reset their life totals, by the way. So that's a good thing. 20 for Evo, 18 for Hank. And there is a Winter Orb. Ooh, well-timed Winter Orb here. And that's going to be super annoying for Evo. And also will turn off that Gemdy Tome. Because now Evo can only untap one of his lands. Luckily for him, he's got the Lanawar Elves and he's got the Mox Jet. So that's uh, actually quite nice. Playing out another Lanawar and a City of Brass. And I wonder now if he's going to use the Book at the End step, Evo. Or if he chooses to kind of keep his, his mana open. Tapping four. There's a Nevenerals Disc. And Hank hasn't been able to deal any damage yet. There's the untap, so no card draw by Evo. Playing a scavenger folk, taking it back, realizing that, hey, wait a minute, there is a, a disc on the table. The best option probably is just to swing in here. And I would consider using my Mistress Factory because then Hank, of course, can tap it with the Relic Berry. But I don't think he will because his lands are tapped out. So interesting here. I would have used a Mox Jet for the Mistress Factory because of that um, Winter Orb on the... The battlefield here and we see Hank using the relic for his winter orb that means that he can untap all of his lands and he's actually going to explode that's quite interesting he's going to use the Nevenerals disc 
despite the little little soft lock he got going there and there's the urnum gin so he's really hoping to bash evo with the urnum oh that's a good reply by evo juzam gin has joined the party 5-5 five, five. beautiful creature of course from the arabian nights but there is a swords to plowshares that means five life for evo but he's going to lose four to the urnum so he's going to drop to 21 here and there is an icy manipulator things are looking up here for hank and let's see what evo can do looking at the card finding a maze of if which is not too bad and there is that scavenger folk we saw earlier he can use the scavenger of course to destroy the uh the icy manipulator that would probably be a good choice the dice is there because it gets force walk from the urnum let's see what hank can do here remember this is the third game so the winner will win this match here at the raging bull series there's a savannah lines and a whirling dervish so he's kind of you know playing out some more threats Probably going to tap down the maze here. Exactly. Going to swing in with both creatures. 2-2 two, two Mishra's Factory and the Urnum. And uh, Evo is just taking the damage. He uh, he had 21 life. So he could take the hit. He's now on 15. Hank is on 14. Going to use the Scavenger to destroy. I assume the IC. Exactly. IC is gone. Tapping. Playing another Scavenger Folk. Those Scavenger Folk can be handy as well um, when Hank's trying to attack with the Mishra's Factory, of course. And I wonder what he's going to do now. The problem, of course, is that Mishra's Factory on the side of Evo for Hank. Because that Mishra's Factory can pump itself, to, uh, can become a 3-3. And as a 3-3, it can kill Whirling Dervish, Shavanna Lines, and his Mishra's Factory. And if he only attacks with the Urnum, Evo has the Maze of If. So, um... Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually quite difficult here, despite the fact that Hank has a lot of creatures. What he needs now is an Armageddon. If he can find an Armageddon, it's probably game here for Hank, but he needs to find one. And, ooh, a Triskelion, and that's actually quite useful on this battlefield. It's a 4-4, but of course he can start taking off those plus one, plus one counters to deal some damage. He can take care of the Savannah Lines and the Whirling Dervish. Right now, there's not really a need to do that. Ooh, interesting. So now in response, he's probably going to do that. Swords on the trike. In response, he's going to kill the Savannah Lines and the Whirling Dervish and deal uh, a point of damage here to Hank. So Hank's dropping to 13. And uh, there is the attack. So sending back the Urnum, taking two from the Mishra's uh, factory. And there is a Chaos Orb. Always great to see a Chaos Orb. It looks like he's going to use it. Is he going to flip on the Urnum? And I believe it was a hit. Urnum is gone. It's always kind of hard, by the way, to see um, how the flips are going because these matches are speeded up times two. So it's hard to see a proper flip. But I'm sure it was if both players agree and uh, it was a hit. So there's the Mishra's Factory. Hank's passing turn here. And things are now really looking up for Evo, by the way. Ooh, there seem to be some glitches, but I believe he lost his factory. Oh, because he animated the factory and then Evo used the scavenger folk. And that's it. Okay, Evo winning this one. <laughs> Congratulations, uh, Evo. Wow, that went pretty fast at the end, also with that glitch. Uh, but yeah, Evo, you've, you've won it. You came back. At a certain point in the match, I really thought that it was going to Hank, but he really needed to find one of his Armageddons uh, at that point. In the in the match well this was it this was the first match of Ray of the raging bull series uh, please follow the channel because we will be back with more action from the raging bull series every Tuesday we will bring you a new match all the way up to the finals so if you like old-school magic uh, make sure to come back next week Tuesday and if you uh, if you like what you see Maybe you would like to support the channel as well. And you can do that quite simply. Like this video, leave a comment. You can also become a subscriber. Uh, all these things are free and all these things really help Timmy Talks move forward. Another thing you can do is you can become a sponsor of the show by joining me on Patreon. There's probably a link popping up right now. Click on that link that will take you to the Patreon page. And when you become a member of Timmy Talks Patreon, you can join our Discord. You can join our Timmy Talks tournaments. Uh, you can join our whatever activities we do and also 
Last but not least, I almost forgot about this, your name will appear in the end scroll. Really? Yes, really. Talking about the end scroll, let's go to the end scroll and take a look to the fantastic, wonderful, amazing channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Ik het als fikker te samba kan zien.